is really common that local people are blamed for the biodiversity loss that is happening in the place. And in this process, the public managers or people from environmental NGOs, for instance, see them as a threat. When, in fact, the main driver for the biodiversity loss in the first place was the big economic enterprises that are around all those areas and that made those people to be constricted in such a small space that they have to make things in a way that could be harmful for the forest. We hear more and more about the climate crisis but at the same time, biodiversity, which is comprised of all living species, is in a deep crisis too. Up to a million species are threatened with extinction by 2050, at a rate a thousand times higher than the natural baseline rate. Biodiversity scientists have identified the five main drivers of this loss. Habitat loss and fragmentation through urban development, land use changes for food production, deforestation, but also building of new roads and other things. Overuse of population through fishing on an industrial scale or hunting. Climate change through direct destruction or shifting of ecosystems. Pollution through human-made industries of all kinds and invasive species transported around the globe by industrial societies. As a solution to this crisis, the UN Convention of Biodiversity Experts are suggesting to increase the network of protected areas. But the way conservation has been done until now, it is more than probable that this expansion will lead to massive human rights violations while ignoring the real roots of the biodiversity crisis. The conservation of biodiversity has been sort of prioritized over the rights of communities over their resources. Fortress conservation has become a serious challenge in Kenya and other parts of Africa and the global south because these are the areas with most biodiversity left in the world today and there are also areas where people are sharing these habitats with wildlife, um, they're sharing these habitats with, um, with all sorts of animals and they're also using that biodiversity and the natural resources for their own livelihoods. For me, conservation has a, a particular African perspective where we, we're selling paradise or we're selling nature uh, for tourism to come and see the animals, to come and see the biodiversity. So you see this beautiful picture of, um, of lions, you see the beautiful landscapes of Africa, you see the, the great white shark uh, um, that you can go and see um, and uh, experience this adventure. But this is often seen as free of people and people's lives and livelihoods, as if this is a um, unspoiled area never been inhabited by people. For someone who has not had the privilege of traveling from Europe or from the United States to Africa, they believe this narrative, it looks true. So when he sees a, a video or a movie or a photo of people near wildlife, he immediately gets alarmed and thinks, oh, that's a problem. That guy should not be there. When the truth on the ground is that guy is there and has always been there for the last thousands of years. So what is happening is a, a, a consequence of criminalizing poor people livelihoods. So it is illegal to access that resource, it's illegal to harvest this resource, it's illegal to sell this resource, and either you are going to be shot at or you're going to be fined or you're going to risk imprisonment because of, of accessing resources that you traditionally access. We cannot just call for the protection of animals at the expense of lives and livelihoods of many people. Right from the beginning, the issue of conservation, the, the very concept is a, is a colonial concept and right from the beginning, national parks, national reserves, like I've said, were established for purposes of exploitation, focusing on wildlife. But the original idea was to establish these national parks so that the hunters would come and hunt, especially the big five. 
Theodore Roosevelt made his famous safari to Africa, which was to Kenya in 1909. And he basically was sponsored by the Smithsonian and he came and slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of, of animals, including lions, elephants, rhinos, etc., etc., for the Smithsonian um, Institution. And he, for some reason, was considered a conservationist. So th this is where the narrative started. But if you look at the narrative, it never included local people. The Native Americans were never part of the story of Yellowstone. African, black African people were never part of Roosevelt's safari. He came back with the names of hundreds of species of wildlife, but didn't come back with the name of a single black man. And you still find conservation heroes, if you can call them that, from Africa. And they tell their stories and they don't have any single name of an African person. Another big aspect of the conservation industry is the research, research in the research sector. There is large amount of money that goes, that is that is given to conduct research in the conservation sector, and a lot of these, the people who are able to access this large amount of funding to do research, are white people. On the one hand, you find conservation in terms of protecting nature, circling a protective area, and and see to it that we protect the resources and whatever is in that area. And on the other hand, we, we have investment in terms of extractive resources like oil and gas. And um, so on the one hand, you can completely destroy the environment. And on the other hand, you have to protect the, the environment. What financialization of nature does, in essence, is it destroys the uniqueness of any one place by cutting up uh, that uniqueness into measurable units or items like carbon storage, habitat for X and Y species. So a consultant can, with their list of ecosystem services, can come and consult those databases and say, here is a forest, let's say, that's very similar to the one that a mining company is going to destroy when it extracts the minerals. That's the idea behind biodiversity compensation, destroying the uniqueness of any one place so it becomes replaceable with another one, so it can be destroyed um, with the argumentation that a similar one is being protected elsewhere. One of the key words in connection with biodiversity offsetting is natural capital. That's the nature of the banking sector, an asset from which profit can be extracted via accounting for and moving around the ecosystem services that are entered into an accounting balance sheet. How can we account for nature? Our coasts, wetlands and forests can also be thought of as assets that need to be maintained and managed. Just like in business, if you don't invest in your assets, they will depreciate over time. This is where natural capital accounting comes in. We start seeing that the idea is ingrained more and more into legislation. Uh, discussed at conferences like the, Con the Convention on Biological Diversities uh, conferences, and one, there is one next year, on the agenda um, of that conference next year in 2021, um, is the idea of a global deal uh, for nature. Biodiversity compensation is a very important part of that uh, global deal for nature, um, and that should make uh, alarm bells ring. Another aspect of that global deal is also a massive expansion of protected areas. Um, again, for many years, that will sound great, uh, that raising the question of well, what's wrong with more protected areas? Isn't that really what's needed? When you, when you say you're going to increase to 30%, I know the areas that have biodiversity is areas like tropical Africa where I live. That's where the increase is going to happen. No one's going to increase the size of Central Park in New York by 30%. So the people on Park Avenue won't lose their apartment buildings. They will increase it in Africa. It's people like me who will lose their homes. We have to call it out as to why do we want to have these protected areas on the one hand, to, so that we can extract and destroy the other 70% of the earth. 
I think on a global scale, we should all look at our, our consumption patterns because that's what's destroying the globe. So everyone's pushing electric cars, but no one talks about the children who are being forced into labor in the cobalt mines in Congo to mine the minerals that are used for these batteries. It's something that we, um, particularly here in Europe, we, we like to not think about that too much. You know, we, we like to have the positive idea that renewable energy will solve us. We can continue as we live as long as we just flip the energy button from fossil to uh, renewable. Um, but that renewable energy, at the scale that we um, intend to continue to use it, will cause massive damage because it needs minerals, lots of them. The carbon footprint of maybe uh, a five-member family in, in Western Europe or the United States is, is probably five times larger than a whole Maasai village in Northern Kenya. And I think people like David Attenborough and Jane Goodall um, purposefully avoid that. And the sentiment behind this emphasis on population in Africa, it's racism hidden in, under many layers of other things. At least for the last hundred years, history shows that there are right-wing groups, anti-immigrant groups, far right-wing groups, and even fascist groups, again at multiple levels, who have had genuine commitments to ecology. And I feel like that is a really important point to pay attention to, because that also shows us that in this political moment, we have to fight for a progressive climate. We have to fight for a liberatory climate. It's not given. Do something now, do anything, is I think that needs to be taken with a pause and to think of the inequalities around the world. Uh, I think it is, it is very important that we are not just jumping on doing something and that something can have consequences to many other uh, people around the world. The main driver for biodiversity loss is the global economy that we live now. So what people do in Europe affects what happens here in with local indigenous populations in the Atlantic forest in Brazil. So it's really important when we are talking about an effective biodiversity conservation that we put political issues and economic issues and issues concerning the system that drives biodiversity loss in the first place as a main issue that we have to deal with.